laat ik uh, heel kort in het Nederlands even het woord nemen. Dat is, uh, we hebben vandaag Ben Lewis, die gaat onze scholing geven over de politiek van Karl Kautz en de Tweede Internationale. So, um, then I think we can uh, give the floor to Ben. Obviously, this is a topic I've spoken on uh, on numerous occasions, something I'm researching and continuing uh, to research when I, as and when I get time. Um, and yeah, hopefully there's, there's some food for thought and some uh, basis for discussion uh, subsequently. So if I understood it correctly, the politics of Karl Kautsky and the Marxism of the Second International, right? Um, both enormous, enormous topics in, and I know that's what speakers say when they, you know, they say, well, I can't cover everything and I can only do this, but they, they, they truly are both uh, tremendously huge uh, subjects that cover a lot of, of material. Um, I thought actually I'd turn it around and start with the Second International and the Marxism of the Second International before looking at the politics of Karl Kautsky, because so, I think one, uh, the one flows a bit more logically from the other, so kind of to reverse it. And, you know, you just think about this question, the Marxism of the Second International. So you have this movement, the Second International, founded uh, for the uh, the centenary of the French Revolution in 1889, um, that runs through to 1914, 1917, you could say, uh, depending on how you, how you define these things. Um, that's 25 years of history plus. It is a movement that encompasses millions of people. I think that at the height, something like 12 million people would have cast a vote, for example, for uh, one of the international's parties in, in, in elections. Enormous organizations of, of varying degrees, so uh, women's organizations, cultural organizations, political branches, and you know, kind of more standard uh, uh, things, economic associations, cooperatives, trade unions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you start to if we try, if we try and uh, condense what we mean by the second international, let alone the Marxism of the second international, um, it becomes clear that we are dealing here with a a huge uh, a topic and a huge amount of, of of material. Now, what is striking to me as somebody who's been working on this for about the past decade is still the very very, without being too Donald Trump about it, very, very, very limited uh, extent to which this material is available, known, discussed, or whatever, right? Um, we have to, so, so, so to, to, to problematize the question slightly, the Marxism of the Second International, it has to be said that what we often understand as or have come to be taught as the Marxism of the second and international is almost invariably a distorted and or limited um, picture or image or a capture of that of that experience does that make sense so what what I'm trying to say is the, the one of the most important points is that even for people like me have been looking at this for some time, the Marxism of the Second International, uh, we're still trying to get to grips with what that actually entailed. You think of all the different um, Congress records, reports of meetings, newspapers, mass newspapers, uh, um, the, the SPD alone had about 95, I think, daily newspapers, right? So that, that's, that's just Germany, forget Holland, France, Britain, you know, Italy, Spain. Um, you've got then the various special interests, so-called uh, periodicals and journals, such as uh, um, the, the Theoreticals, Die Neue Zeit, the Sozialistische Monatshefte, Again, this is just Germany. Um, you've got the Die Gleichheit, the women's the women's uh, press. You've got the Socialist Academic, which was uh, aimed at uh, you know uh, left wing intellectuals, etc. So you've got all this material, uh, and that's not even really covering everything, right? That's just a kind of quick snapshot thing. So when we talk about the Marxism of the Second International, I think the, the one of the most important points to be made is that unless you've been looking at this stuff for uh, a long time, unless you speak German, French, uh, English. Italian, Dutch, ideally as well, you know, you, 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 you almost invariably going to be skimming the surface. And what's still striking to me, although this is changing, if you think about the third international and you read English, which you know, most people do these days uh, in, in, in the world um, to some degree, you can pretty much now, and, and they've almost done it, you can get pretty much every 
um, the minutes of every Congress that the Third International ever held, including very soon the Women's Congresses and the Youth Congresses, right? Because that the John Riddell and Mike Tabor are about to finish that entire project, which is an incredible service, right, to, to us all. Um, and that itself uh, transformed or, or questioned a lot of the, uh, the the kind of common assumptions of left-wing groups about their own past, for example. But when you come to the second international, which had you know, 10, 12 congresses, women's congresses additionally, uh, let alone the, the, um, the, the, the party congresses of the individual countries, uh, pretty much none of that is available today. So that would be my, my opening point is to say, well, you know, it would be rather um, misleading of me to say, okay, this is the Marxism of the second international because it encompasses a lot of different trends competing trends i'll talk about those in a second but it also it, it, you know it's reflected in a, in a huge amount of material that only now i think there's been a partial rediscovery of and and interest in um so that's that would be the uh, uh, the first point the first point here it's a huge amount of history um and a massive amount of of, of socialist uh, literature and and, and, and uh, theory Relatedly, then, on to my um, the the second point uh, I would like to make here is that fundamentally, it's slightly more complicated than this, but fundamentally, the, the there were two uh, opposing trends within the the second international. Fundamentally, right? So it's it's a slightly more complicated story, um, and I'll I'll briefly touch on that story in a second, but. Fundamentally, is what was known as the clash between uh, revolutionary social democracy, as a term that Lenin used on and, and others on, on on many different occasions, and opportunism, revolutionary social democracy, and opportunism. And in a sense, it's it's quite interesting because if you think that the, the Second International was able to unite these different organisations and millions of people behind its banner, what's interesting if you look at the congresses um, from the very start. Uh, they are ca characterized by quite open and protracted and quite intense political conflict. So just to take, if we go back to the start, you take the, uh, the foundation itself of the Second International in 1889 in Paris, there were actually two competing congresses uh, in that year in the same city on the same day, right? Um, there was the the, the Marxist-inspired um, organization that was founded in Paris and also what was a, a competing congress of the French possibilists and their allies, particularly in Britain um, and elsewhere. And the, the, the Marxist congress was largely inspired by uh, none other than uh, Friedrich Engels. Um, and his work in, in the latter years of his life, trying to pull together an international organization, uh, learning from the, the mistakes and the shortcomings and the strengths of the, of the first international. So Engels was directly involved in his correspondence, in meetings, et cetera, in trying to pull together those forces that said, okay, we are a, committed to the international organizations, organization of mass political parties that seek to replace the rule of capitalism with the rule of the working class. And you might think, okay, so you have these two, these two ten, uh, competing congresses, maybe then the question go, uh, goes away. And in fact, the opposite is the case. Right throughout that history, we often see the Second International because of the collapse in 1914 as kind of an organization that as we near that uh, uh, that decisive date, uh, becomes kind of more uh, rivalrous or uh, competitive or, or, or factional, but actually from the very outset there were there were huge uh, factional questions. So in the 1890s, following the success of the Marxist Foundation founding Congress, as opposed to the failure of the Possibilist one, um, you've got this constant question between, you know, who can join? Uh, what about the Possibilist? Uh, what about the anarchists? So you're on the left and on the right, you've got questions, right? Um, and that was a, a defining feature of debates in the 1890s. And I've been reading a book recently about the um, that goes into some quite often quite boring detail about the mandates of, the, uh, of who was allowed to vote and be represented at these various congresses in the 1890s. And there'd be, you know, people would walk out in protest sometimes. Uh, you know, I think the Dutch were quite involved in in the the um, the kind of pro or proto anarchist. 
uh, groupings in the 1890s, and uh, you know they, they would often leave walkouts uh, from from congresses or be ejected sometimes as well, right? So the the, the some of the early Dutch socialists were um, softer on anarchism or softer on uh, general strikeism, I suppose, as as a strategy. So the what what I would say is that this these these debates these conflicts really define it from the start, and it's not the case. So while the Second International is set up on the basis of an opposition to reformism and possibilism on the one hand, and an opposition to uh, anarchism and general strikeism, if you like, on the other, it's not the case that then that's all settled and dusted in eighteen eighty nine because these things go rattle on. Uh, right through, you know, into the early 1900s, even 1904 in the Amsterdam Congress, you could say you could say again the general strike question comes back onto the agenda in quite a strong way. <clears throat> so it, it's a it's a it's an organisation. It's, it's a paradox because on the on the one hand you've got this uh, um, organisation, you know, incredible fract factional uh, fratricidal struggle, but on the other hand it does it is able to cohere uh, millions of people. Uh, around a, a political organization uh, and hold them together in many ways but it wasn't just like i say it wasn't just okay here's the organization now it's done and dusted uh, these things rattled on for uh, for many years to uh, to come and i suppose that is a, a a kind of nice way perhaps to move on to um karl kautsky preface these thoughts though again with the you know almost invariably and again I'm, I'm probably speaking to you know preaching to the choir here in a sense that you know almost invariably the Marxism of the second international so-called um, as a kind of static and in many ways superficial treatment of uh, that formation and its ideas is a negative one that we've inherited right so you know um, if you seek to draw positives from that experience basically your this would be the accusation you are kind of um brushing over the the line between reform and revolution etc cetera, etc cetera, um opportunism and all the rest of it um and that's worth remembering um what's also worth remembering is that for all its um <clears throat> failings and all of uh, and the fact that it collapsed effectively in 1914 so-called revolutionary social democracy um, the revolutionary elements in the uh, in the second international went on to form the basis of pretty much every communist party uh, that came out of that that struggle in between 1914 and 1919 1920 depending on the, the, the 21 even um, so that that's also worth uh, worth remembering how does uh, Kautsky fit into this well he effectively him and uh, uh, Edward Bernstein are effectively the heirs, the intellectual and political heirs of uh, Engels to a certain extent, right? And the and the SPD, um, they are the seen as the leading uh, voices of Marxism within the Second International. There are others too, but these two are uh, particularly seen as those have you know carried on the banner, uh, as it were. And Kautsky plays a an absolutely crucial role. Precisely in the discussions and the conflicts I just outlined between, on the one hand, possibilism and the idea that the socialist movement can benefit from uh, gaining a seat or a, a, a seat at the table in a capitalist coalition government, whilst on the other hand, um, rejecting this idea that the, the general strike represents some kind of panacea or elixir, if you like, to with which to move from capitalism to socialism, and you know that that whole strategic point of view, known as you know, the Marxist center, again, you know, you'll all be familiar with this, um, is is broadly speaking the the line which holds the second international uh, together. Sometimes. Uh, or not always in a in a in a particularly principled or absolutely principled way. There are um, instances, for example, where, and I think this is a, this is a weakness of um, of of Kautsky's in particular that he is um, often quite keen or overly keen on making concessions to the right, trying to seek uh, unity as much as possible. Um, but essentially, those are the the politics which inform uh, that organization and. You know, allow the politics of socialism in various forms um, to be received, understood, and uh, enacted upon by by millions of of people. Um, 
Now, in terms of the, the politics of Karl Kautsky, it's a little bit like the Marxism of the Second International. It is a one of the, one of the problems I've located with Kautsky scholarship, and there are many. Uh, but one of them is to treat the politics of Karl Kautsky or the thought of Karl Kautsky as a kind of static, unchanging, um, uber historical uh, Weltanschauung, right? As this, this kind of this this was Kaut, this is what Kautsky thought. Um, and and that's the end of it, basically. And and often that's bound that's bound up with a with a negative uh, uh, appreciation. So, Kautsky had a fatalist or Darwinist or determinist conception of change, and therefore he wrote this in 1904. Therefore, he did this in 1907. And therefore, when it came to uh, the German Revolution, he played the particular role that he played at that time, which I think is um, a very again superficial, static. Uh, uh, appreciation of the man's life and work. I've been translating, as some of you know, Karl Kautsky for a long time now, over a decade. And I have a funny, um, Lars Lee and I, I have a list because we're always trying to think of books that we want to do. And one book we want to do is basically a reader which shows every Lenin text, every Lenin text next to every Kautsky text that's where Lenin po positively comments on the text. So Lars, doesn't that be a great idea? Let's do a book. I say that's a great idea, Lars. And uh, so he goes, I tell you what, go away and find me all of Karl Kautsky's articles in Die Zeit. Okay, that's pretty easily done these days. It's all digitalized. You people will be able to have, uh, you people, you Dutch people, uh, will be able to have uh, enough of an understanding of German to get find your way around the uh, uh, the website itself. Very easily done. And we have we have a file which we occasionally open and laugh at. And this is just this is just Karl Kautsky's Die Neue Zeit articles. So from roughly 1884, 384 through to 1917, April 1917, and there are 484 articles. And these these articles are not kind of like you know your uh, you know your quick commentary, uh, 500 word piece on X, Y, or Z. They are often seven to ten thousand words long, often parts of longer series um, on on the questions of the age. Right. So, like I say, this I, I come from the perspective of somebody's work with this stuff quite intensely for some time, but we are very much still uh, um, dealing with the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the politics of Karl Kautsky. And while scholarship has got slightly more diverse these days and people are working more, I think for good reason, and it might be interesting to discuss why, uh, for example, uh, the second international is taken more seriously today, or, or you know, it is gradually being so. Um, th this is still very much a, 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 a tiny po a portion of the political output of Karl Kautsky. Um, so we have to be wary of, of, of that too. The guy wrote an enormous amount, and I think the only only as and when we become a bit more familiar with that work and discuss it more. Um, do we get a more rounded appreciation of Karl Kautsky, the man and his politics? Um, you may, some of you may be aware of my general take on, on Kautsky is that fundamentally, I think, oh, the evidence I've seen so far suggests to me that Lenin, um, broadly speaking, has it right about Karl Kautsky, broadly speaking. And that is a very, very controversial slash unpopular view uh, on certainly in academia, of course. I mean, let's forget about academia for a second, because you know, as soon as Lenin comes up in academia, you know, uh, some people get away with like August Nymphs. Uh, once you, you know, he's done some work uh, with academic support on on Lenin, unless it's like shitting on Lenin, obviously, and then then you get lots of money, or you used to. Um, but uh, but Lenin broadly has it has it has it right, I would say. But in in terms of the far left and the the ideas that we've inherited about so called second international Marxism, the politics of the, of Karl Kautsky, um, that hasn't been the approach of the of the far left. It's actually to say that yes, okay, um, Lenin may have been right that Karl Kautsky was a renegade. So in in the sense that yes, clearly in 1914 something shifts. So the, the, the 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 it's the straw that breaks the camel's back, as it as it were. Something happens, but actually, if you look at Kautsky, the seeds of the, the of the rottenness were there from the start, and maybe Lenin didn't see that. Maybe Rosa Luxemburg did to a certain extent, um, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's the way these things have been handled, and I think the the general um, consensus around Karl Kautsky as not having anything to do with uh, revolutionary politics, uh, let alone Bolshevism or anything, or the Russian Revolution, 
Um, that is starting to come apart, uh, partly on the basis of some of the new work. So if you look at, uh, I mean, not just my stuff, but stuff that goes back a long way now, um, there's a good volume called The Witnesses to Permanent Revolution by Richard Day and Daniel Guido, uh, which I think is online, actually. And, and that contains just a, a huge amount of material on Kautsky as a, a strategic um, kind of teacher, in a, in a sense, when it comes to the question of the Russian Revolution, which is his emphasis is you know, a popular alliance between the proletariat and the peasantry led by the peasantry, no illusions in, in um, a smichka or an alliance with the, the bourgeoisie, uh, no illusions in czarism, and those kind of fundamental strategic uh, approaches that you know, he writes extensively about in the early 1900s leading up to the, <clears throat> the 1905 Russian Revolution and beyond. Um, that they are kind of common sense uh, and, and taken as such at, at the time. So that's broadly my perspective. I think Lenin is, is, is generally correct. Uh, what Lenin doesn't do, and, and it gets a little bit lost in terms of the history as well, because uh, those of you may know, I've done a book on uh, Kautsky's republicanism recently, which shows pretty much that many of the claims that Lenin makes about Kautsky in 1917 actually don't stand up to historical inquiry and Lenin probably would have known that as well this is I've dug up some texts of Kautsky's from 1905 which kind of undermine uh, some of Lenin's points but broadly speaking I think the the, the idea of the renegacy of the, the, the real tragedy in that sense is historical tragedy of someone like Kautsky is refusing to live up to the perspectives that he and others had so eloquently outlined um in in the past i think that's that's broadly correct what i've been able to show at least to some extent uh and more work certainly needs to be done is how <clears throat> you know if you compare kautsky's writings on revolution and revolutionary change from say 1905 1906 with some of the stuff he writes about the german revolution in 1918 1919 it is astounding it's almost as if two people different people are um speaking right about about these events so you know on the one hand in 1905 Karl Kautsky is a very big fan of the Paris Commune the idea that um, revolutionary change does not entail simply uh, not, not let alone coalitionism but it doesn't even entail a socialist government being elected and then introducing socialism through the old bureaucracy the old army the police etc etc but then when it comes to writing about 1918 and 1919, he basically thinks that Germany is socialist. So the Weimar Republic, the early days of the Weimar Republic is a socialist republic, which flies completely in the face of everything he had written about change before, because it wasn't, it, you have to, what, what was the, the early Weimar Republic, just to finish, I suppose, the, 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 the early government of the Weimar Republic was not simply the SPD, if it was the SPD majority government and it was kind of introducing socialism through existing channels, you could maybe say, OK, Kautsky kind of has a point here. This, this could be called a socialist government. However, it quickly has to do something about the army. It quickly has to do something about the state. But this was a coalition government between the SPD, the Catholic Center, which even though it had uh, occasionally uh, left-wing rhetoric particularly when it comes to came to some of its unions that it organized was a right-wing organization had been a right-wing organization for a long time and german liberalism which you know reading a lovely text by Rosa luxembourg recently on on the republic and she says you know the reason we have the three-tier system in Prus prussia the reason we have a reactionary monarchy is the fucking german liberals they sold us out in, in, in the 18, in the 1840s and the 1850s and uh, you know th that's where it ended up so you know there's it's almost to say that there's a there's a shadow of kautsky as his former self now explaining that accounting for that fully uh claiming to be able to really to say this is this is what happened um i think is is a difficult task um but it does it should at least start with um recognizing that there has been a fundamental change and that is precisely uh whether it's pro kautsky or anti kautsky that is precisely what uh, scholarship on kautsky has failed to do hitherto in i.e it says that yes okay kautsky uh, did said this in 1918-19. He was he was a good reformist socialist and kind of whole, always had been, unlike uh, uh, unlike Bolshevism. And that that is a um, to me that that's insulting as history. Uh, but what's even more insulting about it is that, as I said, uh, the outline of this 
through the uh, the kind of our mother's milk of, of revolutionary politics that many of us on the left have had, uh, we've kind of accepted that as as true, right? <laughs> and and I think that would be um, you know, certainly one of the things that I see in my own uh, work and kind of limited contribution is to say, no, I think that's wrong. And moreover, it's not only wrong, but it's based, as I said at the start, on a very limited appropriation of material from this particular period and not taking it seriously in its own terms. And, uh, you know, those 460 odd uh, uh, Karl Kautsky articles uh, that I spoke of, you know, they, they certainly need to be worked on. And, you know, there's just so much uh, material there that needs to be looked at. It's crying out for uh, investigation and research. Academia is not particularly interested at the moment. You, there are there are certain exceptions that people do uh, kind of cultural history. You may have heard of a guy whose name currently escapes me, uh, Kevin Callahan uh, wrote a book called Demonstration Culture. I reviewed that for the weekly work. I'll try and put it in the um, link. He's an academic in America that looks at, um, how can I put this without being completely disparaging, kind of academic ideas about communication theory and uh, and, and uh, language, et cetera, about how the Second International was able to cohere as an organization when they had all of these things so there are some uh, there are some exceptions but generally it's not being done uh, and, and that is a real shame but you know hopefully that will change and we will be able to set the historical record uh, a bit straighter on this um, and I think I, I was going to go into why that matters but I, I think probably for this meeting and the people I'm speaking to it's that's probably not as much of a pressing issue maybe it is we can discuss that but I, I realize I've run over my time already uh, despite having written pretty much nothing down so far, these guys. And um, yeah, I look forward to your thoughts and, and uh, questions and, you know, uh, anything I've got wrong without writing anything down. So thank you very much for the com uh, invitation, comments. I really appreciate it. And uh, it's great to be here.